Hello there. Welcome back to the booth here at Mythic Championship 2 from London. I'm Marcel Sexton. That's Paul Chion. Hey, this is where it all comes together, right? This is the run up to the top eight. This is where you don't want to miss a single second of action. We're in, we're heading into round number 15 here, Paul. And in our feature match area, we've got two heavy hitters. We've got from Spain, Javier Dominguez. He's sitting at 11 and three playing for Team Hal Ruiz Sword. Uh, also in the MPL, both players, in fact, Seth Manfield as well for the United States playing for Team KMC Genesis. On Dredge, also at 11 and 3. This is an intense moment for both of these players, potentially a career defining moment. Yeah, absolutely. Two of kind of the, the best players in the world, Javier Dominguez, the reigning world champion here. Now, and if you were to sit down here, by the way, Paul, in this situation, winning in, are you assuming a win would put you in uh, under most circumstances? Uh, you know what? Actually, not necessarily here. There's okay. a ton of draws kind of coming into this uh. round. So it might be difficult because you, it, it might be kind of hard to figure out, you know, how many of these players with draws get paired against each other or get paired up or paired down. So a lot of, there, there could still be a lot of variables. But one thing is almost certain. It's a lose and out. If you pick up that fourth loss, it is extremely unlikely to make it into the top eight. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe one person... Can, can squeeze in if everybody has to play out the last round. And Javier here with, you know, one of the most important cards in the matchup, especially against Dredge. Thing in the Ice allows you to potentially reset the board in case the Dredge decks do get explosive starts here. But Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are we just getting super aggressive here for Javier Dominguez? He just cycled through two Mana Morphos, and here's another thing in the ice and a land. We could see him just beat down. Yeah, I mean... That Why is, wait? Right. The, the, we, we had a deck tech earlier where basically they were saying, look, with thing in the ice, sometimes you just want to be more aggressive than you think because it ends the game quickly. It's a three-turn clock. It's yeah. a seven-power creature. Yeah, it really is uh, much quicker than it looks on the surface, especially when it's all frozen in 0-4-E. Yeah, but a big dredge here. Cathartic reunion out of Seth Manfield. Hits life from the loam. Needs to find another dredger, and he does find it. That's a Golgari thug, which allows Seth to dredge four, but has not found a Narcomy but yet to get that prize amalgam in until... Oh, there it is. There's one. So three dredgers in Seth Manfield's hand. Now the Narcomy but will trigger the prize amalgam. And Seth will put a couple of creatures onto the battlefield. Not, you know, he was able to dredge Ooh. a good amount, but still not super explosive. Look at this. Serum Visions was a draw step here for Javier Dominguez, potentially finding him another spell. And it he does. Needs one more. It was another copy of Serum Visions off the top there. So we are going to see this thing in the ice transform into an awoken horror and send the team pack in there uh, for Seth Manfield. But more importantly, perhaps here, just take the race to him. Absolutely. Because, you know, the prize amalgam in the hand, not going to do a whole lot. Seth is going to have to find a way to put it into his graveyard. And of course, Javier at this point just wants to end this game as quickly as possible. You don't want to get dredge the time to, you know, start dredging Faithless Lootings and basically dredge your entire deck. And, you know, I think Javier just deciding what he wants to do. He has an Arclight Phoenix in hand. No way to put it into his graveyard. But, you know, sometimes you can just hard cast Arclight Phoenix and get in there. Boink, boink. The Awoken Horror. And boy, you know, you mentioned that it's a three-turn clock on its own. If its little friend there can join the fray uh, <clears throat> starting next turn, it's just over. Yeah, and this is an excellent scry here from Javier Dominguez. That's a Faithless Looting oh, as one of the options to scry. So he might, you know, with if he finds Faithless Looting into another spell next turn, he will be able to flip the other thing in the ice, and that will be a lethal attack. That would just be game. Right. Of course, the dredge deck low on interaction. That's not really what it's about. I think Dark Blast might be the only actual instant yeah, in the main. Yeah, they can like, affect anything <laughs> other than, right. than the graveyard. Javier mulling over his options here. <laughs> so Javier does have uh, one thing he could have done here. He has a Lightning Axe, so he could have discarded Lightning, uh, Arclight Phoenix to Lightning Axe. Um, and target his, his Awoken own. Horror, which would <laughs> tick the Thing in the Ice down one. But more importantly, that would be the third spell he plays this turn, which means he would have been able to get in, an ad in additional attack for three with the Arclight Phoenix. But as it stands, Javier says, look, what is Seth going to do? If he floods the board with creatures, I'll just cast two spells next turn and kill him. 
Right, absolutely. I think Seth right now has to be afraid of the other thing in the ice flipping. Might actually choose to use the conflagrate here and get rid of that thing in the ice just so he can survive an additional turn. In a di uh, wow. Yeah, an alternate way for Seth to stay alive, even if Javier Dominguez attacks in for 14 this turn, is to just cast the Cathartic Reunion in his hand and hope to dredge enough cards and hit some Creeping Chills, which will allow him to gain enough life to survive an attack for 14. All right. Conflagrate in the yard. He can play the flashback cost of red, red, and discarding X cards. Oh, and that's what he's going for here. Now, he does actually have eight cards, right? Right. <laughs> and he does have a prize amalgam. That's a free card. That's basically a card that he wants to eliminate from his hand. There's a blood guest in the yard, so he can discard prize amalgam and all of the dredge cards that he has. Okay, so he's going to go just for the four on the, uh, <coughs> on the thing in the ice there. Right, then he can play out a land, get that blood guest onto the battlefield, which will then trigger the prize amalgam in the yard, which then Seth will have in play at the end of his turn. Okay, so Javier Dominguez loses one of his key threats. Oh, Seth doesn't have a land, actually. How is that possible? He had eight cards in his hand. Okay, well... Faithless looting. Now, maybe a little bit of a different look here from Javier Dominguez as far as what it is that he's searching for. It's not just about transforming that thing in the ice uh, anymore since it's gone. So I think that's a gut shot in Javier Dominguez's hand. So it he is. can return an Arclight Phoenix if he so chooses. Seems good. He could get in for 10 damage and uh, have that Arclight he, be he can lethal. Actually, he can actually play Steam Vents here flashback Faithless Looting because if he does find an additional Arclight Phoenix, that's a lethal attack because oh. he can use the Gut Shot as the final spell to return the Arclight Phoenixes. He can just uh, just pitch the, uh, the Lightning Axe in hand. So Go for that. Find, yeah, Javier just wants to find another Arclight Phoenix. Lightning Bolt would also be very good. Uh, he did not find an Arclight Phoenix. He found Pyromancer Ascension on land. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think he necessarily will have time for Pyromancer Ascension, so I think he's probably going to discard it here. But there it is, gut shot upstairs, the good old fashioned way here. So this is an attack. So Seth Manfield is going to go down to twelve, and this is an attack for ten. So extremely close here for Javier Dominguez. He just needs to be able to get in one more time with either creature, and the game will be over. Also, as you mentioned, a card like Lightning Bolt would end the game on the spot as well. Right. Seth needs to find maybe some Creeping Chills and Narc Amoebas, get, some, get something going here. He does find a Narc Amoeba, which does have the ability to chump block the Awoken Horror. So that's seven damage that he can prevent. Can he play, put another creature into play to block both creatures? Because he is facing down two lethal attackers. I think Seth needs to use Cathartic Reunion here to try to hit either Narc Amoeba or Creeping Chill just to try to gain some additional life. Yeah, he's still facing lethal, so something needs to happen here for Manfield. And keep in mind, Javier Dominguez still has Lightning Axe in hand, so he does have the answer, as he can discard any card he draws to the Lightning Axe to kill the Narc Amoeba. And just get in with that Phoenix and end the game. There it is, Cathartic Reunion. All right, big dredges. Let's big see. Big McDredgerson's here. That was that a miss. That was nothing, though he did find another Stinkweed Ip, so we get to do it again. Okay, there was a Creeping Chill in there. Okay. Now, that actually will put him out of range of the Phoenix by itself. Right, but he still needs to find another Creeping Chill or Narc Amoeba to actually stay alive because, again, Javier Dominguez can remove the Narc Amoeba right, from the battlefield. This is it. This is the last dredge he has. Another Steak we have. This is 15 cards. There's another Creeping Chill. Okay, so now Seth Manfield is up to eight life, but I still don't think that's enough. No, not with the removal spell in here right. for Javier. Right. 
So Seth will be able to put in a few prize amalgams this turn, but given that he's at eight life, Javier Dominguez simply needs to just kill the Narc Amoeba with the Lightning Axe and attack in for 10, which will be lethal. Yeah, the most important card in this matchup is Thing in the Ice. And Javier Probably Dominguez yes. knows that it's over. He says, sure, are you done? Is that all you got? Because I got a Lightning Axe, and yep. I got a draw step coming, and that is going to be lethal for Javier Dominguez crashing into the red zone and finishing off Seth Manfield in game number one. He took a very aggressive line with the two copies of Thing in the Ice that he had in his opener, and it certainly paid off for him. Looks like he's played this matchup a fair bit and understood his role quite well. And it served him well. That is Javier Dominguez winning game number one. We're going to have more live magic action here from London right after these messages. Hey, everybody. I'm here with John Stern. We're going to crack a pack of War of the Spark and see what you're going to take first in our hypothetical draft here. Right. What do you think of the set so far? It's pretty fun. Yeah, I like it a lot. I like that there's uh, 10 different cards on there. Draft, so. All right, let's see. I have nothing great in the comments so far. This card's pretty good. You can kill a Planeswalker or a creature. Uh, I like having two drops. I don't want to commit to two colors, so my Planeswalker's Jaya, which is pretty decent. And this guy I haven't played with yet. Um, oh yeah, I played against it. So when you hit him, this, this is my, my pick one, pack one. Uh, when you hit them, you get all this mana and you can castle your stuff. So. Yeah, it's great. I'm going to take that first. I'm expecting probably Jaya or Spark Harvest to go second. So why do you think Spark Harvest is a card or a common people should have their eye on in this draft format? Uh, well, it's just, it's very versatile. Like you can kill, basically, you can spend one mana in a pinch when you need to. You can kill a Planeswalker, you can kill a creature. There's a lot of conditional removal, uh, like the burn spells don't always hit the guy you want. Um, even the minus five, minus five doesn't always get the creature out of, out of play. So like, this is just a really good card. So talk to me a little bit about Planeswalker since we've got Jaya here and you're passing her up for something and normally they're just like a slam dunk. What do you think about Planeswalkers in this format? Are they all created equal? Well, this Planeswalker in particular, it has only a minus. So basically it's going to come into play. You're going to use it twice, most likely. So it's two shocks, so it's quite good. Um, it turns your other red creatures and improves them. Um, but after that, it basically just sits on the board and doesn't do a whole lot. Whereas this guy is going to have an effect every turn. And also, you sort of want to protect your Planeswalker, so you need a board presence. Um, and there's a lot of them, so generally you want to be drafting creatures that have a low curve, so you can do that. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting card. All right, so we've gotten a heb here for John Stern. Pack one, pick one of War of the Spark. And welcome back to London. We're here for Mythic Championship number two. Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Cheon. Welcome back. It's nice to have you along. We're watching Modern here on day number two. And if you're just joining us, we are down the stretch. This is the second to last round of Swiss play before we cut to our top eight in just a, another hour or two. And we're going to check in here on Brian Bronduin, who is having really one of the best runs of his career here, at least at the Mythic Championship level uh, with humans. He is sitting at 11 and 3. And he's up a game against Yuki Matsumoto, who is playing Red Eldrazi, and of all things. Looks like he's significantly ahead here on board as well, although he is sitting at 9 life. Yeah, I still like his spot by a lot here. Yeah, Yuki Matsumoto does have a Ratchet Bomb for 2, but it's only going to get one card. So going to get the Thalys Lieutenant. That's a good card to get, but still going to be taking damage there from the Mantis Rider. And we all know how quickly that damage can add up from Manus Rider. This Obligator looks like it's going to get in the red zone again, but lots of good options here for Brian Bronduin to uh, leverage his board state to yeah. either trade off or even some of his life total if he'd like. Right. Also, three mana. Uh, sorry, uh, Ether Vial on three, too. So mm -hmm. Brian could have any number of the powerful three mana creatures, Reflector Mage. He's just going to trade off Champion of the Parish. Say, sure, I'll trade off my one drop for your Eldrazi Obligator. What's the follow-up play here? Eternal Scourge, it looks like, from yeah. Yuki Matsumoto. This is actually one of the key cards in the deck, though this isn't necessarily the way it was uh, drawn <laughs> up, just hard casting it out of his hand. I mean, you could do it. Nothing wrong with it. He has 
the uh, temple there that makes it a little cheaper, but uh, you know, this is kind of uh, serum, serum powder and this work well together. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, you know, a free creature if you do use serum powder's ability to kind of take another mulligan. This deck allows you to aggressively mulligan to you know, piece together either some combination of um, Simeon Spirit Guide into Chalice of the Void for one, which will be able to win a lot of different matchups. And of course, also just looking for Eldrazi Temple. I think this deck will often just look aggressively for Eldrazi Temple because I don't think you can just win kind of a fair game if you're just playing lands in your creatures. And then if you've ever watched any deck that is uh, Eldrazi based, you'll, you'll be familiar with uh, the package of creatures that you see quite often. Uh, the Eldrazi Mimic, the Reality Smasher, and the Thought Not Seer are the most common ones. This one is actually running Matter Reshaper as well. And here's a Dismember. I'm assuming this is going to kill the Manus Rider. Okay, so we got a real fight here between these two. It looked pretty good for Brian Brondoon when we uh, chimed in, but I think it is uh, looking a little worse now. Yeah, so this phantasmal image is... Kind of locked in, isn't it? Yeah, it's copying something, right? Did it already, uh, did it already copy the Mantis Rider? Or I, it looks like it was a dismembered res response. Right, so I would assume that it has to be a Reflector Mage at that point. Oh, no, he chose, to co he chose to copy the Eternal Scourge, actually. He just wants the 3-3? Three, three? Yeah. All right. Ooh, and that's a big draw from Yuki Matsumoto. What did he find a Thought Knot Seer? He has a Reality Smasher, but it looks like he wants to clear the way first with this Thought Knot Seer. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Well, things getting kind of interesting here. Those are two copies of Deputy of Detention in hand there for Brian Braun Dewin. Yeah, and Brian and probably going to fire it off here. Just on get the, the TKS out yeah, of there? Yeah, on the Thought Knot Seer because he will be able to draw a card as well. Yeah. The Thought Knot Seer leaves the battlefield. Might as well, as they say in the business. So he's going to draw a card and then go to his turn and draw another card. This could be a big swing back in Brian Brondoon's direction. Ooh, and that is a meddling mage. I wonder if... Ooh. I'm very curious what Brian's going to choose to name with this. Is it two meddling mages? Oh, that is two meddling mages. So Does he have the mana for it? Yeah, he yeah, does. He does. Double a, trouble. A double trouble. Boy, he could really lock out Matsumoto if he knew all the cards in his hand at this point. Right. So now Brian has to think about the possible combinations of cards that he's most scared of here. Right. You know, is it Dismember? Is it Reality Smasher? Is it another Thought Knots here? Mm -hmm. And the cool part is he gets to pick two. Right. I mean, that's actually just huge here, right? Like, given the Definitely. board state and the knowledge that he has, look, only one card left in hand for Matsumoto. And he can really try to craft the way that this game's going to go going forward. Yeah, Brian probably just wants to name the, the large creatures that are in Matsumoto's deck because, mm. you know, any reality... He doesn't know about the reality smasher in hand, but if any reality smasher off the top would be able to get in for a good chunk of damage. Also, you know, I have to say that's the card that just comes to mind, right? Yep. Like, if I just say, what's the scariest thing Eldrazi does? Well, it's reality smasher. Right. And also, what, what, you know, what's the most likely card for him to have still left in his hand? Right. Given that Thought Knots here was already cast... Yeah, just very curious to see what Brian chooses to name. Yeah, the judges will print it out and bring it over so that we can get a uh, look at that. But he could be stranding serious cards here in hand for Matsumoto. I would guess that one of them is Reality Smasher, though it looks like he did not name Thought Not Seer. Also, Thought Not Seer, no cards in hand for BBD. So a 4-4 four -four on the ground, nice, but it could become a liability in a little while if Brian finds a way to uh, interact. Ooh. Is that a, a bugler? That militia is a bugler? militia bugler, and oh, oh. Does, cannot cannot find Mantis Rider. No, gets you creatures of power two or less. But that is a phantasmal image, so he gets to bugle again <laughs> yeah. if he wants, or he can choose to copy Reflector Mage to bounce the Thought Knots here and get him for some attacks and get a card. Right. Huh. The copies of Mutavault, though, a little annoying here for Brian Brondoon. They are threatening to trade off for at least a few of the creatures that could attack on the ground, like the uh, meddling mages. Yeah, however, Brian will be able to get in for a, a good chunk of damage. If he bounces the Thought Knots here, Matsumoto cannot play it. And then even if he activates a Mutavault, if that trades with one of the meddling mages, he can still get in for five points of damage here, it looks like. A.K.A. half. Yeah. Half of the total needed here for BBD. This is uh, this is not a lock for top eight if Brian Brondoon were to win this match. That is Reality Smasher, by the way, named on one of them. But it does put him in a really good position, and he may be able to draw in. 
we, we won't know. Right. And he won't know either until next round. But still, this is getting tantalizingly close for Brian Braun doing to a Mythic Champion shop top eight here. He's only got to win one game against Yuki Matsumoto, and it looks like he's ahead right now. Yeah. A little bit interesting that he's thinking so long about whether or not to make this attack because, you know, once you already commit to the Phantasmal Image, you should probably have a good sense of what you want to be doing after that. But, of course, just making, you know, we are playing for a lot here, just making sure we get this right. The other option would have been to, of course, copy the Militia Bugler and try to just put more creatures onto the battlefield. So he named Smasher with both? Oh. Is that what I'm seeing? I don't think so. What does it say? Matter Reshaper, I believe. Oh, Matter Reshaper Reality Smasher. Okay, gotcha. Wow, and that was it. Brian wow. Brondewin finishes the deal, and boy, he's getting very, very close to a Mythic Championship top eight. Now, he is going to have to check those standings and show up next round and see if he's got to do a little winning in action or maybe if he can draw in, but that was a very big step in that direction there for Brian. So congratulations to him uh, and uh, good luck in the next round. But we're back in action here on our main table. Oh, that, that's a reasonable start, I think. You know, the old turn one Faithless Looting pitch to Arclight Phoenixes. Whoa, Phoenixes. that is deal. super scary for Seth Manfield. But, you know, it looks like Seth, I mean, this, this is, he mulligan to, I don't know. It looks like this is many, many mulligans, because I don't see a lot of cards left in Seth Manfield's hand. I know we talked about kind of the two biggest, two decks that got the, the biggest advantage of this new London mulligan. Uh, I think Dredge and Tron were kind of the two consensus decks that got the biggest edge because, you know, it's looking for a very specific card. So, of course, having the ability to look at a full seven cards every single time you mulligan does help you find that Faithless Looting or the Ancient Stirrings or that Expedition Map. It is interesting how people approach this because, well, you and I were having a chat when we were out sightseeing. We came in a little bit early and hit up some museums, and we were talking about the mulligan rule, and it was like, wait a minute. Like, every deck, everybody who plays the deck goes, well, you know why my deck is better with this mulligan rule? Right. And it's like, at some point, you and I looked at each other and we're like, what are the decks that don't get better? <laughs> like, maybe we should focus on those because almost every deck, now, it is varying degrees, right? right. So, sure, there may be uh, some edge to be gained, but it's not like if you look at how much better Tron is and it's just relative to the field of everybody else saying, well, my deck stayed the same. Everybody's right. like, well, my deck's better too. Yeah, yeah, the, the London mulligan is just... By default, just a stronger mulligan, right? right? For everybody across yeah. the board. So and every for different reasons. Right, right. So everybody is going to just have more real games of magic. However, this, despite that, the, the, you know, the Tron decks do still get a little more of a bump because they are looking for highly specific cards where, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, if you're playing a, uh, a mid range deck with a bunch of removal spells, a lot of the hands kind of look very similar. You know, it's like, hey, this Tarmogoyf could easily be a Scavenging Ooze or, you know, this Inquisition is a Thoughtseize. You know, there's a lot of redundancy built into to some of the decks. But, you know, for, for decks like Tron, or Dreads that's looking for the Cathartic Reunion, the Shriek Horn. Um, you know, they get a, a slight edge. But yes, I do agree that every deck does, in fact, get a lot stronger. So Pyromancer Ascension for Javier Dominguez. He's left those two Phoenixes in the graveyard for now. And Seth Manfield is kind of working his way forward. He's got a Blood Gas on the battlefield and a Price Amalgam in his graveyard already. Yeah, and so the reason why he ran out the Pyromancer's Ascension here is he does actually have three spells, but he doesn't have the mana to cast them. So you don't want to just be firing off your, your card draw effects here on turn two because he has those two Arclight Phoenixes in the yard. So it's better to just wait until turn three to ensure that you can get those Arclight Phoenixes onto the battlefield. Also important to note that, you know, Javier's got to be aware of the matchup, right? And the truth is, is that Dredge is not the type of deck that just kills you out of nowhere. It's a fairly consistent, hard to interact with deck, you know, outside of graveyard hate, but it is not fast. Right. So he actually has the time to take a turn off here and now start to set up the future. So this is Faithless Looting, and let's not forget, he already has one of those in his graveyard, so that's a counter on Pyromancer Ascension. Yeah, this is, oh, yeah. How and quickly can he get that Pyromancer Ascension online? Because he can just win through that, too, right? Oh, absolutely. And look at this. You know it's a bad sign when your opponent's discarding oh, oh. Serum Visions. Because he has uh, another one, and the Ascension is online already. Now he gets he gets 
the scries, and he will now be able to thought scour himself and do it twice because he has the two counters on the Pyromancer's Ascension. Ascension. What an explosive turn here from Javier Dominguez. And wait a minute, if he hits more Phoenixes, uh, <laughs> those will come in too? Yeah, l let's just make it four. Why not? All right, here we go. Let's see if he can do it. Here's thought scour number one resolving. Draw a card. Here's the copy. Oh, oh he did actually hit a is. third Phoenix. Boom, baby. All three of them are going to hit the battlefield. Oh, my goodness. What is Seth Manfield supposed to do? This is active Pyromancer this is Ascension just one and triple Arclight Phoenix. This is just one of the best possible starts. He has two counters on Pyromancer Ascension and three Phoenixes here on turn three. <laughs> and guess what? He also has a Surgical Extraction in his hand. Oh. That's two Surgical Extractions because of that Pyromancer Ascension. Oh, oh my goodness. What a beating from Javier Dominguez, Seth Manfield, sitting at 11-3, and three, thinking, okay, let's play some magic, let's have a nice fair fight, good luck to you, and Javier is having none of it. That was an explosive turn three for him. <laughs> look at that port state, and he's got a grip of cards too. Let's take a look at what he's working with here in his hand. He's got Thing in the Ice, Serum Vision, Spell Pierce, Thought Scour. Wow. Yeah, so he will have more ways to find cards. And Seth setting up the defenses here with the hard-casted Stinkweed Imp. <laughs> <laughs> Not what he wants to be doing. And Javier, you can, you can tell he, he smells it. He's very, very close to victory here. Sleight of hand lets him dig deeper. He just needs to find a lightning bolt here. If he finds a lightning bolt, that will get the Stinkweed Imp off the battlefield, and he will be able to attack in for that lethal nine points of damage. And keep in mind, by the way, Seth with an incredibly slow hand. Yes. He mulliganed, it looks like, at least three times yep. to get to where he was, and he did not find Faithless Looting or uh, Cathartic Reunion to kind of get one of those explosive yeah, starts. Yeah, this is one of those extremely lopsided games where one player mulligans and stumbles, and the other just has that perfect draw. And it looks like he's going to go for Mana Morphos here. And let's not forget this now generates extra mana for him and cards. Mana Morphos really where you want to be after Pyromancer Ascension gets online. Absolutely. So now Javier's going to have four mana available to him with the second copy of the Mana Morphos resolving. Probably just thinking about, you know, which color mana to add here. Sleight of Hand was the draw for the world champion. Probably going to cast the sleight of hand. It does let him dig the deepest. By the way, this is a proper MPL fight down the stretch oh, here yeah. as well. Of course, these players are going to be seeing a lot of each other over the course of the next year in various battles. Maybe get a little rivalry going because this is a high stakes match. Make no mistake about it. The winner of this could be in top eight. Will likely have to consult the uh, the pairings board, but still a really good chance for a top eight here. Javier just really looking for a lightning bolt yeah, here to get, finish the game off this get turn. That stupid imp out of the way and win. That's what he's trying to do anyway. He can now serum visions, which will happen twice. He can also Dotscar himself. Maybe he finds Arclight Phoenix number four. Yeah, if he had that in his hand, he could actually hard cast it right now, too, he and could, win the game could. that way. He also has Faithless Looting in the graveyard still, which he could flash back. Mm -hmm. But I think he, he would rather use the one mana spells first. Oh, wait, no, no he never is mind. He's going to flash back Faithless Looting. All right. So if he hits a Phoenix here, it will come back and the game will be over. But he didn't. All right, another Faithless Looting here. <laughs> Don't mm, think he wants Anger yeah. of the Gods <laughs> right now, Paul. That's my expert analysis. Oh, okay. I'm not going go, not gonna cast that one. And Javier has already played a land for this turn, so doesn't look like he has, he has uh, you know, I think Seth Manfield might have one extra turn to survive here because it doesn't look like he found a Lightning Bolt or Arclight Phoenix number four. Now, what does a sequence look like, though, where Seth actually gets out of this? Uh, because the, the Arclight Phoenixes will not stay dead, even if they were all to die. Absolutely. And also, Seth can dredge, think we did, maybe something like dredging four creeping chills. <laughs> but 3, 6, 9, 12. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But Javier also has surgical extraction in hand, I believe. We can take a look at, uh, at Dominguez's hand here. I don't see it right now, but it looks like uh, he didn't go a through a ton behind. of cards. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Th th this is a nightmare for the spotter. <laughs> I, I, I do this job sometimes, too. And 
I'll tell you what, Pyromancer Ascension, Jace the Mind Sculptor makes life very difficult. Now we can just get a look there. Oh, there's that, that's a Ravenous Trap. Looks like two Ravenous Trap. Okay, so not surgical, but two copies of Ravenous Trap here. Yeah, so he can actually fire that off as well. Yeah, and on top of that, he has Spell Pierce up, or double Spell Pierce. So he can't die to, you know, some gigantic Conflagrate out of nowhere either. Right, no Conflagrate, also Creeping Chill, so... Yeah, and this is kind of interesting. Javier immediately moving to blocks, and the reason is he can just get these things back. Oh, yeah, it's going to be trivial, especially with that Pyromancer Ascension in play. That's right. So now Javier is probably going to be kind of putting a stop before the second main and still in combat after damage resolves and maybe wants to use the Ravenous Trap. That's exactly what's going to happen. So here's Ravenous Trap. It's traps, I guess, in this case. And the reason to do this now is there is the chance that Seth Manfield plays a fetch land. If he plays a fetch land, he can put the trigger of the blood guest on the stack, and if Javier responds with a Ravenous Trap, he can then sack the fetch land to still get that blood guest onto the battlefield. And you know what? Seth has a fetch land in his hand, so very clean play there from Javier Dominguez, showing why he's the champ, how he got into the MPL. Look at these defensive stink items, though. Even if Javier is able to get those Arclight Phoenixes in play, I mean, Seth has some defenses set up here, but again, Lightning Bolt, a singular Lightning Bolt is all, it's, all that's, uh, that's going to take here for Javier to take this down. Also, he does have Anger of the Gods, so if he has land, two spells and Anger of the Gods, that'll also be enough. Yeah, he can just get them out of the way, and there it is, a mountain. So here's Anger of the Gods, which is actually going to do even more. And there's two spells, and that is the win for Javier Dominguez. <laughs> One step away from a top eight here at Mythic Championship 2 in London. Super impressed by him and his play, as I always am. Fantastic stuff from Javier Dominguez. And bittersweet, though, for Seth Manfield. That knocked him out of top eight contention. You see Marcio Carvalho come on and uh, give a quick congratulations to Javier, because Javier is actually getting set up to have a quick chat with our own Tim Willoughby. So while they get set up, we'll come here for a minute, but uh, we're gonna get a chance to hear from Javier. And what I'm really curious about is how good of a chance he thinks he has to, to make it into the top eight, because at a normal size Mythic Championship, usually around 400 players, he would be in. Right. We've got about 500 here though, so he's not a lock at this point. Yeah, I mean, this is where we have generally Rich between rounds really trying to break it down and figure out who is locked, but I don't want to count anybody locked in just yet because with all the draws that we've seen in this tournament, it's going to be hard to kind of predict whether or not you are locked uh, into that top eight. Yeah, we don't want to you know, get ahead of ourselves here, of <laughs> course, but Javier will have a good idea for it, and of course, he'll be thinking about these things and lining that up. And you know what? We've got Javier down with Tim Willoughby right now. I'm here with Javier Dominguez down on the floor of the Mythic Championship. And Javier, you've been in these sorts of situations before, but we can still see on your face how much it means to you when you win these big matches. We're getting late in the day now, and you're on a very, very good record indeed. And we got to see some fireworks there with Pyromancer Ascension. It's very, very cool what it does in this deck. Yeah, it's like a combo value card. Like, it's supposed to be a combo card, but then in the deck it's more like a value card. So it's like you pay two mana, and eventually you get a lot of value out of one card. So it's, yeah, I would say like a one one army, you know? <laughs> yeah, I saw you. I think you managed to draw 10 cards on the turn before you won, just digging potentially for a lightning bolt to end the game a little bit faster. It's kind of amazing how your deck can race even against these very fast decks in the format. Yeah, I mean, Arga Phoenix is just like that, that good. <laughs> you can just sometimes get two or three and turn two or three, and it's just like nine damage, and it's, Sometimes it's just too much. Are there any decks in, the, in this field that you're really afraid of? What, what are your matchups that you're worried about, maybe? Well, the joke about Phoenix is like it has no good matchups. So I really think most matchups are like 50 50. I guess I don't want to play against Strong, but I think most decks are just like fine against Phoenix, and Phoenix is fine against them. I guess the secret is just to be the world champion, and the rest of it sorts itself out. Congratulations to Javier Dominguez here at Mythic Championship 2. Thank you for that, Tim. And uh, you can see the big smile on Javier's face. He is getting that close to a top eight here at Mythic Championship 2 in London. We've got Time Walk Magic for you now. And uh, by the way, speaking of getting close to a top eight here, this is Yuya Watanabe. Yuya is playing against Eli Loveman. Eli's on 11 and three for the record. Yuya's 12 and two. This is a win and in for Yuya Watanabe to try to make it <clears throat> into the top eight. Let's see if he can do it. 
This is about as clean as they get here for Yuya. Yuya's playing Tron, as you can see, and he's got two-thirds of the way there with the map that is turn three Tron locked in. It is humans for Eli. And what kind of... Oh, well, there's a meddling mage. What do you even name? Karn? I don't even know. Karn, Oblivion Stone is also a good option. Yep. Ugin is also a card that you could consider. But, I mean, there's, uh, there's any number of really, really powerful threats that Yuya can play here. Oblivion Walking Stone. Ballista. Mm -hmm. He named Oblivion Stone, so could we see Karn here? Well, Yuya's taking his time if that is what he has. Right. It's usually Karn. They always have turn three Karn. <laughs> I feel like they always <laughs> have turn three Karn. Never not. Yeah, let's take a look. I mean... You know, Worm Coil Engine is also pretty strong, but it is pretty weak against specifically Reflector Mage. It does look like it's a Karn. Yeah, it's a Karn. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's turn yeah. three Karn. Yuya Watanabe, everybody. Everybody's favorite. Yeah. So now what does he do? Does he start working on the board, or does he just plus it and put Karn at a cool 10 loyalty? Well, the problem is if he minuses the Karn, it's really likely for... Eli to be able to kill the Karn mm. this turn. You know, if he can go land <coughs> Mantis Rider or even play a Thalia's Lieutenant or a Noble Hierarch, he will be able to get in for three points of damage to kill the Karn. But maybe Yuya wants to just uh, deal with the, the creatures at hand. He probably has a strong follow-up play here. I bet you he has another Karn. Yep, and there is that Noble Hierarch. That's going to enable Exalted to take out Karn, so not really what... Uh there's a draw. You wanted, this is a draw step kite sail freebooter here okay, from so Eli. This could help. This could help. So if there is something like an Ugin or a Karn, he would be able to get that. And of course, you want to do it on the draw step to get the maximum amount of information and cards to to try to take out of Yuya's hand. See what Yuya is working with here. Well, it's land, 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 Sylvan Scrying, and he's got wow, no other, no other right. big hitters. So it looks like he's taking the Dismember here. So now Yuya still has that Ancient Stirrings. So he can use the Ancient Stirrings to find a big threat. He also has the Sanctum of Ugin. So if he does find a big threat, he can play it on the following turn and then play Sanctum of Ugin and then look for something like a Walking Ballista or Ugin or any of those cards. I mean, I imagine he's going to fire off the Ancient Stirrings here. Heck yeah, get I another card. <laughs> It's got to be one in the top five. That's how this deck works, right? Yeah. That, ooh, that was a lot of strong options here. So there's a... It looks like I see I see a Worm Coil Engine, a Walking Ballista, and I think also a Karn. There was a Karn. <laughs> He's going to go for the Ballista, though. I've seen uh, Yuya make this line pretty consistently here. He just decimates his opponent's board with the Walking Ballista. It is extremely difficult for the humans to beat this card after it hits because even if they find a way to kill it, it usually takes two creatures down with it at, at the minimum. Right, absolutely. It really shines in this matchup. We're going to see Reflector Mage target it. Oh, <laughs> But uh, Yuya has some really nice options here. He can remove two of the counters, if he'd like, to uh, kill the Kite Sail Freebooter. And that would get him Dismember back. And then say, sure, I'll hold on to this Blista for a turn. Yeah. You'll see it again, and I'll have more and mana not next a ton time. of pressure yet from Eli. I mean, he's no. had a good start, <laughs> uh, a solid amount of disruption. But keep in mind, Yuya's got Tron at any given point. He can just draw one of those haymakers yeah. and, and win the game. And he's just going to have time for Walking Ballista. But now that he has the Phantasmal Image, he's going to copy Meddling Mage and name that Walking Ballista. That's right. Although, keep in mind, uh, Yuya has Dismember in hand, too. So maybe he names Dismember. He probably is forced to name Dismember, but it doesn't work out well for Eli either way, does it? Right. But he, if, he, if he names Dismember here, it gives him a, a turn to find another Phantasmal Image or a Meddling Mage, mm -hmm. which will, would ultimately probably be naming the... Um, the hanger, sorry, the walking ballista right. uh, in Yuya's hand. Yeah, tough spot here for Eli. He does need to start piling on a lot more pressure as well as Yuya could have uh, a haymaker at any point here, though. It looks like this turn, no, just Sylvan Scrying plays the second tower and passes the turn back. Oh, so, so he named ballista, and Yuya, of course, will have to use the dismember. Oof. This did not work out well for Eli. Yeah, so, 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 so right. So now Eli, <coughs> does he have another Meddling Mage? No, I think he's just going to probably lose to this Walking Ballista. Because keep in mind, Sanctum yeah. of Ugin is also on the battlefield here. Right. 
Their so, Sanctum of Vugan. So this is a walking ballista for 12, or, <laughs> or 6, rather. 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 for 6, 6, and the Sanctum's going to get cracked. This is going to be Yuyu Watanabe winning this one. Oh, yeah. Now he's going to get an Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger. And he, he, he can use the walking ballista here to... To just absolutely decimate mow the board. down the board, if right. you'd like, from Eli Loveman. This has really turned into to, to a disaster scenario for him. He, he could have given himself that one-turn window to find another meddling mage or something similar, but even then, that was a slim chance. And look at this. Yuya actually did not go for Ulamog mm -hmm. and just went for a second copy of Walking Ballista. He, lo because he loves it against humans. Oh, yeah. It, it, is, it is one of the best cards for sure. Yeah. I couldn't help myself. I would just go for... Oh, and the big daddy. Right. So now Eli is forcing the action here using Reflector Mage on a Walking Ballista. So let's see what Yuya chooses to do here with the counters. It looks like he's going to take out just as many things as possible. He's taking out the Meddling Mage, the Noble Hierarch, and I, I guess the uh, Kite Sail Freebooter right. with the remaining two. Oh, you know what Yuya's thinking about is just firing off all the counters here, which would counter that ability and let him just replay the next walking right. bullets the next turn. To try to minimize the damage. But keep in mind, this Reflector Mage is coming into play at the end of Yuya's turn. So does that oh. mean you can just let that happen and yeah. then play it again on the following turn? Yeah, and you know what? That's exactly what Yuya's checking here. He's saying, wait a minute. Will I be able to cast it on my next turn? Right. So Yuya, yes. just, Yuya just making sure that that's exactly what, what's going to happen here. Because, of course, if that's the case, then you just let the bounce happen. And yeah. maybe you just get the Kitesail Freebooter off the battlefield. Exactly. But if it's not, it's definitely worth considering. I mean, the second walking ballista, how important is that really to Yuya's plan, right? Right. If he resolves the second one, I mean, and I mean, what I mean by the second one is having two of them. If he resolves the second one, it's over. I mean, right. Eli will have no board and be facing down a very large walking ballista. Right, and this is kind of just what's being discussed right now, as you can see right now. How does this interaction work? Yuya has found himself in the, a couple of pretty unique situations already in this, uh, in this tournament. Yeah, and it looks like he can play the Walking Ballista on his next turn. Yes, he can. Ooh, what a draw Hello. from Eli Loveman. Meddling Mage naming Walking Ballista. Boy, that's wow. a game changer. Yuya Watanabe did not diversify his threats here. Is he right. going to be stuck with two Walking Ballistas in hand and taking a bunch of damage from Eli? Oh, my. Okay, that was a good draw, though. That was a Worm Coil Engine. If Eli doesn't have another Reflector Mage or Phantasmal Image, Yuya does have the blocker here, but, yeah, that was a, that was was a phenomenal draw. It was. It was Eli. another Meddling Mage off the top of the library, but that's not good enough here. This, uh, this Worm Coil Engine simply dominates this board. Yes. It is so good against these creature decks if it ever gets to stick around and enter combat, really in any capacity. So Eli Loveman already uh, finding two of his Reflector Mages. <laughs> Chad is great. Man, who would have guessed Tron would draw another threat? <laughs> 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 that is the name of the game with this Tron deck. It is actually much more oh, threat dense than it seems. Oh, but that's a Phantasmal Image on Reflector Mage. Oh, oh my the goodness. top deck for Eli Loveman. Bang, bang, off the top of the library. How did you, you lose that game? <laughs> well, I think the big point there, the big turning point was when he decided to get that second walking ballista because that leaves you vulnerable to Reflector Mage. Mm -hmm. He could have had two different threats in, right. uh, in his hand, and he didn't. And boy, did he pay for it. Right. That was huge. Remember, Yuya's playing for top eight, and Eli Loveman is maybe also playing for top eight. This is huge stakes. Those were massive top decks. Yeah, and keep in mind, Eli had to draw, like, back-to-back -back ways to, you know, interact with what Yuya was doing. He needed to find Meddling Mage for Walking Ballista. Oh, yeah. oh he drew like a god of all that <laughs> one. I'll tell you that, Paul. But that's what you put the, the cards in your library for, isn't it? So here is Kitesail Freebooter now from Loveman. <clears throat> what does he see here? He sees Oblivion Stone. He cannot take the... Uh, 
the worm coil, and his other option is a chromatic sphere. So, so probably stone. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I've narrowed it down for you, Paul. What's your expert analysis? Well, I, I don't even need to be here, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Just> <laughs> All right. <laughs> he took the card that he named with Metal Image every single opportunity he got. Ooh, ooh. That was Ugin off the top of the library. Now, we don't have Tron quite yet, but as you can see, that expedition map effectively guarantees it for next turn. Right. He will be able to play it next turn. And Ugin is the best card against humans. Yes, Ballista is amazing, but Ugin is like everything's gone. Yeah. It, Ugin's like an Oblivion Stone, but that stays on the battlefield after you minus. <laughs> it kills every creature you cast for the rest of the game <laughs> after killing all the creatures you exactly. already cast this exactly. game. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Not, not great news for Eli Loveman if that one hits the battlefield, which it does look like it's going to do next this, turn if left unchecked. This is pretty interesting, though. Eli does have a pair of meddling mages. I wonder if he's just going to name all the cards that he's going to lose to. So I would think Walking Ballista and Ugin would be two of the cards to, to name here. Yeah, now, from a numbers game perspective, Oblivion Stone, and there he did name Oblivion Stone. There's four of those in the library versus only one Ugin, Paul. Oh, there's only one Ugin. Yeah. Okay, so, so, some decks play two copies, so that makes sense. It's a numbers game. Yep. Uh, but, of course, you Drew... The one Ugin. Yes, he did. He's got <laughs> oh, it in his hand. Man. And this is going to be ugly. Shield your children's eyes. Don't look <laughs> at the screen. This is graphic. Just trump oh, things. Oh, yeah. Ugin, the spirit dragon, comes Th down and wipes over. away everything. Yeah. And Eli says, I'm just going to take these little pieces of paper <laughs> off of my lands. And he says, why are you doing that? Hey, why, come on. I, yeah. Let me have some more fun. I, I want to uh, play some Odrazi. You're still at 20, man. All right, game number three here in a win and in for top eight for you, Watanabe, and a win and get very close to top eight for Eli Loveman, though not quite as guaranteed given the fact that Yuya is playing down this round. Wow. So Ugin the Spirit Dragon. Does Yuya have... Tr I'm assuming he has Tron. You of usually just does. mulligan until you get Tron, so this is yeah. Sylvan Scrying. Okay, well, he has Tron now. All right. Keep in mind, humans doesn't really have... Uh, a lot of ways to deal with... With the lands? With the lands. I mean, uh. some uh, human decks do play some copies of uh, Damping Sphere in the mm -hmm. sideboard mm -hmm. to try to slow that down. Let's see if Eli is running it. He, he, is, he is running that in he, his sideboard. He does have three copies of Damping Sphere, but he doesn't have it in hand. Okay, here's Worm Coil Engine. Now, again... It needs to enter combat to be good, so a card like Reflector Mage would be excellent here. And, and this there is, it is. This is a nice, aggressive draw. Look Whoa, at this. Whoa, look at that. Mantis Rider number two after the Reflector oh, Mage. Wow. Three, six, seven, eight, nine damage. Yuya needs to find a sweeper here. He has to find a way to get rid of multiple cards off the battlefield, or he is going to be dead. I think we're going to see a Sacrifice Chromatic Star here. A Desperation uh, Chromatic far, Star? Well, the thing is, it's it's a free sack anyways because you're filtering the mana. Yeah, so but just what looking. I mean is because he doesn't have the card in hand. <laughs> right. He does have Ulamog, and I think he has Urza's Tower. So if he plays Urza's Tower, that gives him 10 mana. He can play the Ulamog, get both of the Mantis Riders yes. off the battlefield, and then he will have a blocker for the Champion of the Parish. That would be good here. Uh, as, again, assuming Eli doesn't have a card, uh, like another Reflector Mage or something. But well, it's it's probably going to be on top. Yeah. So, oh right. Yeah, he keeps know. that one on top yeah, of yeah, his yeah. library. I understand. Right. Got to play around the hand disruption. All right. It, it looks like it's uh, it's it's lunchtime here in London. Ulamog the ceaseless hunger says, "What are we having?" Howmph! <laughs> and away goes the two uh, Mantis Riders. Those are the obvious choice, at least. Although Yuya, he's thinking. So let's yeah, see what another he's thing here. he's considering is maybe Mantis Rider plus Champion of the Parish, because if Eli does play another Reflector Mage next turn, then if Eli plays another Reflector Mage next turn, he will only take five points of damage. Mm -hmm. Wow, so close. Yeah. So, so close here. But then you now, will still need an answer to that Mantis Rider on the following turn. Right. Now, if it is Reflector Mage plus a human, any any human, then that is lethal, right? Right. Okay, so... The, no, he did actually take out the Champion of the Parish. Oh, and there Mantis it is! Rider. Another Mantis Rider! Oof. And... Bang! That is enough for lethal, and Yuya Watanabe falls to the human stack of Eli Loveman. Now, that brings both of those players to this uh, X and 3 record, which means 
that they're both live for top eight probably here, but we're gonna get some uh, fireworks in the feature match area next round. So boy, we've got a lot of news to bring you over at the news desk with Rich and Maria, but first we're gonna take a short break. We'll see you after that.